Well, good morning and welcome to Lathrop First Christian Church. If you're watching this video here today, it's because you are tuning in to watch the sermon that I actually preached this last Sunday. Uh, sadly, the audio was not recorded. I just had a video. And even though I am loud, I am not loud enough to where when the microphones are turned off, it will still go into the camera. So I am re-recording. So if you are watching, that might be a little bit of the difference that you see maybe in the presentation. And if you are watching a second time, maybe that's why you're not seeing something that you heard on Sunday as I don't use a manuscript. And if you wanted to see me put my foot in my mouth again like I did on Sunday, I'm hoping that's not going to happen. But... As we begin this, uh, this is such an important message, and as I started doing research for this, I didn't have to research. I understood the problem that I was going to find. I've, seen, I've read enough. I've talked to enough ministers. I knew it, the problems that I was going to find, but I always think that if I can maybe have some numbers and some statistics, that might help put into perspective some of the things that we're talking about. And so I was looking up some of the stuff about ministerial stress or the stress of the pastor or pressure that is put on the pastor. And I started finding some of these statistics. They're up on the screen. Uh, in 2013, there was a study done that reported that 1,700 pastors leave ministry each month. Each month. And they are citing depression, burnout, and being overworked as their primary reasons for leaving. Also, we can see that on average, a seminary trained pastor lasts only five years in church ministry. And now, I do want to say one thing briefly before I move on here. Well, let's show this next one and then we'll, I'll briefly talk about it. So in November of 2021, another study was done. And it reports that 34% of all pastors are seriously considering leaving full-time ministry. Now, as we look at some of these numbers and things like that, I do want to clarify something because while these statistics are eye-opening, I do want to at least make sure we understand that not all ministers or all pastors that leave church ministry, all of a sudden they're losing their faith or all of a sudden they're rejecting God or anything like that. Uh, some of them maybe are. You know, some of them, they might be doing that. I don't want to say that doesn't happen. But a lot of these ministers and pastors, they are going into uh, other ministry callings like parachurch organizations, maybe poverty outreach, or they go into pregnancy centers or things like that. And maybe for some of them it's leaving, it's leaving full-time ministry, but they're still going to do a little ministry in the church. Okay? So I just wanted to clarify that, that not, may, not necessarily all those ministers leaving uh, church ministry are necessarily leaving the ministry or leaving the faith altogether. They're just not ministers in a congregational setting. But up there we also have another statistic. Pastors are twice as likely to report feeling depressed compared to the general public. We also find out that 91%, that's a big number, 91% have experienced some form of burnout in ministry and 18% say they are fried to a crisp right now. And that was from that November 2021 survey. And so, yes, you could say, you know, COVID had 
a influence on those numbers. Yes, you could say that, but I really think these numbers, if we look at those numbers from that 2013 study, these numbers are very eye-opening, and I'm not sure COVID actually increased it a whole lot. I think this has just been a broad thing for quite a while. Another statistic we found, and this is the one that I find so sad, 80% believe that their pastoral ministry has negatively affected their families. That being in ministry has not been good for their families. 80% believe that. And even worse, 33% say it was an outright hazard to have a family while doing ministry. The last statistic that I have I'd like to talk about, or just at least briefly show, is this. 10% of pastors that were surveyed, 10% have expressed having suicidal ideation within the last year. 10% of ministers. And so these are big numbers. I hope they're eye-opening numbers for you as well. And all of these surveys and all these statistics, all these reports always come up with 50 or 60 different stressors in a minister's life that is causing these things to happen. There were the reasons for these statistics. And I've taken a lot of those and I've kind of boiled them down into three categories of the stressors on a minister, the pressures on a pastor. The first one that we see over and over again in different ways is is a lack of community or isolation or loneliness. Now, some of you might be saying, how can a pastor be lonely? He's got a congregation. How can he not have community? He has 40 or 50 people each and every Sunday to have community with. And one of the reasons that community is so hard is breaking down that divide between minister and congregant. Not only that, everybody in the pews, for the most part, have friends outside of church. Whether it's at their work or maybe they were raised in the town and they have it that way, whatever it might be, you have friends from other locations, not just church. For ministers, for the most part, your friends are the church. You don't have outside friends. And so when you get together with your friends for coffee, what they want to talk about is church and everything going on at the church. And usually it's usually the negatives going on at the church. And that can cause a lot of stress and put a lot of those pressures on the minister. The next thing that we see is one of the big stressors a minister has is the pastoral responsibility. We're going to talk about this in a little bit. We're going to talk about this later on today because this is one of the things that I think the church can really help with is the pastoral responsibility because I am going to tell you Scripture has a high view of what a pastor is and what he should do. And so those responsibilities can weigh on a minister. Uh, you know, I was, I can tell you that ministers go through highs and lows and sometimes it's just an hour or two apart. There was last year, I remember doing a youth activity and I don't remember what activity it was, but I was doing a youth activity and as soon as it was over, I was leaving to get in my vehicle to drive over to Oak Ridge Nursing Home because a member of the congregation was over there dying. And I went and I sat with that family. Okay? And so running around outside all crazy like with uh, high schoolers to being in the nursing home with someone dying. It's just an emotional roller coaster ride and yet those are the pastoral responsibilities. And never forget that no matter what happens on Sunday there is still a sermon that needs to be preached. 
I'm not complaining. I don't want you to think that I'm complaining. I'm not complaining. I'm just uh, being real with you, so to speak. I'm just letting you in on some of these stressors that a pastor has. And there's a reason I'm doing that. We're going to get there. I promise. We're going to get there, okay? The last real stressor that I see whenever I look at these surveys and all the different things that come up is this. Expectations. Expectations from the congregation and expectations from the pastor or the minister themselves. Now when I'm talking about this, sometimes people think I'm primarily talking about expectations on my family or the minister's family. And you know, ministers I do think largely live in that glass, that proverbial glass house where everybody is watching the spouse and the kids and how things are happening so uh, they, those family members are held to a higher expectation than the rest of the congregation. And I do think that is unfair, but I do think that's something that happens. But that's also not necessarily exclusive to pastors. We have school superintendents, both current in the church, and we also have the daughter of a school superintendent and Judy Wright, and they will tell you that school superintendents' families live in a glass house as well. Okay? Everybody's looking to them, and when they mess up, everybody wants to hammer home on the topic. Okay? And, and so a pastor's family is not uh, unique to this. Many positions that are kind of public figure positions would have those types of expectations. But what I see here are those expectations, for instance, of people in the church saying, we need to focus on children, we need to focus on youth, we need to focus on young family, and the minister says, okay, I agree, and we're going to go at it, and we hammer home, hammer home, hammer home on that. And then it, all of a sudden, members of the congregation's coming up to the pastor going... Well, what about us that's been here for a long time? Why aren't you doing anything with us? And so it's, there's only so much a minister can do, and he can get stretched so thin, not just because of those pastoral responsibilities, but also because the expectations that have been placed on that minister, that pastor. And you know, I think the church as a whole can really help a minister or a pastor out in two of these three areas. Lack of community, that minister's going to have to figure it out, okay? Going to have to figure out how to set boundaries, got to figure out how to make other relationships. Maybe it is with just making relationships with the other ministers in town or in the area, things like that. But the church can really help out with the idea of pastoral responsibilities and expectations. I keep playing with the iPad because it keeps uh, dying on me and uh, I need it or I'm going to get lost in my slides. So hopefully it's going to last. If not, I'm going to have to take a short break and run over to the sound room. But I do think that the church can really help with those pastoral responsibilities and those expectations. Do you know why? Because our church is well suited in its leadership structure because I believe we have a very biblical leadership structure and I think scripture put this leadership structure in place for a reason where we have elders and we have deacons where the deacons are helping with those program type things in the church and those elders are helping being the be, being those spiritual leaders as we've talked about before and one of the things that is so important for us to think about is this. In Scripture, elders are called three different things. Okay? In Scripture, you will see elders called elders. You will see them called overseers. And you will see them called pastors. Now, when we think about elders we are thinking more about the qualification side of things. Or that's what that term is primarily talking about. Now, another word for elders is presbyters. I put it in the wrong spot, okay? 
presbyters is also called elders. And so the Presbyterian church gets that name from the idea they are led by elders. But that term speaks more of the qualifications of that position. The next title we see used is overseers. Now in some Bible translations you might see that word translated as bishops. And so overseers or bishops, it's the same Greek word just translated a little differently. And in that aspect, they are, we are focusing now more so on the responsibilities to teach rightly for church discipline, or as Acts chapter 6 says, as we was looking at the book of Acts chapter 6 last week with the deacons, it talked about them administering the word, the administration of the word. And so that's that right teaching, that right doctrine type things, okay? And then the other term that is used to talk about elders in the church is pastor or shepherd. Pastor and shepherd come from the same word, okay? And so when you see pastor and you see shepherd, you can think of it as the exact same thing. And that role we see in scripture is primarily almost always talking about focusing on people and their issues, whether it, we're talking about counseling or whether we are talking about helping somebody with a sin that they have in their lives and overcoming that, whether it's talking about visiting the sick or the shut-ins. That's what we are talking about when we talk about that term pastor. And so these three terms are all used interchangeably and they all talk about a different aspect or a different uh, thought when it comes to what an elder is. And so first let's begin with that idea of an elder and those qualifications. What are those qualifications for an elder. If you have your Bible with you, turn to 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. The Apostle Paul here lays out some qualifications that all elders are to meet. Starting in chapter 3, verse 1, it says this. Here is a trustworthy saying. If anyone sets his heart on being an overseer, he desires a noble task. Now the overseer must be above reproach, the husband of but one wife, temperate, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not given to drunkenness, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own family well and see that his children obey him with proper respect. For if anyone does not know how to manage his own family, how can he take care of God's church? He must not be a recent convert or he may become conceited and fall under the same judgment as the devil. He must also have a good reputation with outsiders so that he will not fall into disgrace and into the devil's trap. And so as we read this, we can really see two different things, two different broad categories. If we paint this, uh, these qualifications with broad brush strokes, we can see two broad categories of qualifications. The first one is about how somebody lives morally. Okay? We can see that. We can see the, how somebody lives as one of those qualifications where it talks about being temperate and being self-controlled, respectable and hospitable, those kinds of things. 
But he also says an overseer must be above reproach. And it also says he must have a good reputation with outsiders as well. So these, uh, this being morally upstanding or above reproach is not just for those in the congregation, but for those outside of the church as well. Should be looking at those elders and saying, yes, they are living a, lot, a, a different kind of life, you know. They are living the good life. Now, when we talk about that reputation outside of the church, we are really talking about those moral standards, okay? Especially those moral standards. They're not, we're not talking about if, if they believe the same things you believe. For instance, in this church, we can talk about Christ as our Lord and Savior, but if that makes somebody, if that hurts their feelings outside, that's not the type of stuff outside the church that the Apostle Paul is talking about, okay? And this also means that, an el- it doesn't mean, it does not mean that an elder has to be perfect and never sin ever again, okay? That's not what it says either. either. This is talking largely about a trajectory because we understand all's going to fall short, all's going to sin, and sin's going to continually happen, okay? But we're talking about a trajectory of what your life is. Is it a life that is bringing you closer to God and everybody is looking at you seeing that Christ-likeness come out of you? Or is it where you're just stagnant and just kind of getting by, going along to get along? Or is it one of those where you're actually uh, moving away from God? Where your actions show that you do not live a life of repentance? Okay? And so that is what we are talking about. Are you on that trajectory that shows you are living a Christ-like life and you are growing closer and closer to God? Okay? The other main qualification, the broad category, brushstroke uh, qualification we see is the idea that you must not be a new convert. Okay? That means you are grow, you have been growing in the faith and you've been maturing in the faith. You are rooted solid to that faith. You know what you believe and you can talk about it. As it says it here, another thing is to be able to teach. Are you able to teach others? That's part of being mature in your faith. Now that teaching does not necessarily mean getting up here on a Sunday morning and preaching. Okay? Doesn't necessarily mean that. Doesn't necessarily mean leading a Sunday school group. But can you be in there with a small group? Can you do mentoring one-on-one where you're studying and growing in Scripture? Because that's what you are called to do. Okay? And so when we think about an elder being mature, we are not talking about a intellectual thing. We are talking about a spiritual thing. For instance, you could be 70 years old and get baptized, but that does not mean because you're 70 years old, you are qualified to be an elder because spiritually you are still immature. You are still a babe, okay? And so that's one of the things that I want us to realize, these two big broad categories of qualifications for an elder, And so, let's go to the next passage that we have. We're going to be in Acts chapter 20, if you want to turn here with me, to Acts chapter 20, because this is such an important passage to me, especially when we talk about elders. Uh, Growing up in the church I grew up in, I think we always focused on that 1 Timothy 3 passage when it came to elders. But I think uh, Acts chapter 20 is really important as well. And so here's what's going on. The Apostle Paul calls on the phone, not really, but he calls the elders at Ephesus and he says, here, come meet me, I want to talk to you. And so the elders all show up and he goes to speak with them. And in this passage that we have, we're going to read verse 17 and then we're going to drop down to verses 28 through 35. But what's special about Acts chapter 20 is you will see all three terms for an elder used interchangeably. You'll hear elder, you'll hear overseer, and you'll hear shepherd all be used 
interchangeably. And that's why another reason I wanted us to look at this passage as well. And so in Acts chapter 20, starting in verse 17, it says this. For Maltus, Paul sent to Ephesus for the elders of the church. And then basically it says, they arrived. Go down to verse 28. This is the Apostle Paul speaking to these elders. Keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God which he bought with his own blood. I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you and will not spare the flock. Even from your own number, men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after them. So be on your guard. Remember that for three years I never stopped warning each of you night and day with tears. Now I commit you to God and to the word of his grace which can build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I have not coveted anyone's silver or gold or clothing. You yourselves know that these hands of mine have supplied my own needs and the needs of my companions. In everything I did, I showed you that by this kind of hard work we must help the weak. Remembering the words of the Lord Jesus himself is more blessed to give than receive. And so that's our scripture reading here. And we saw those three terms used where it talked about being shepherds of God, of the church of God, where they were called the elders of the church, and where it says uh, that they are overseers. We see all of those terms in this passage that we looked at. And one of the things that becomes really clear as we go through this, is the Apostle Paul wants to make certain that yes, you're shepherding the people and you're caring for the people, but you're also making sure they're not being led astray. They're not listening to false teachings day in and day out or Sunday after Sunday. Somebody needs to be held accountable for the teachings of the church and that somebody is the elders that somebody is the elders. As I read these passages, I go, you know, the pastor, what we call the pastor, me, sometimes in some churches they don't even call me a pastor because that would mean I was an elder. They would have called me the evangelist or they would call me the preacher. I would not have the title of pastor or minister, whatever it might be. And part of that is to show that the elders have authority over the pulpit, over the teachings that come from this position. But as I look at it, I go, look, when you're in the church, you should feel as if you can come to me and talk to me about anything you want, if you have questions, if you, whatever it might be, and I should be able to try to help you. Now, I'm not perfect in everything, and I've said that before. For instance, I'm not the biggest counselor person. That's not my spiritual gift. Uh, but if somebody comes to me and needs counseling, guess what? I have a uh, church connection with a friend that does marriage counseling for free. And they're a trained counselor, and they're in a church, and they will help us out. Okay? But you shouldn't just feel comfortable coming to me about those things. You should be comfortable going to all of your elders about those things. Those elders have the exact same position I have. They have the exact same duties as I have. They have the exact same title that I have. And in fact, I was, Scripture is full of duties and responsibilities of elders. And so I want to tell you something. I personally have a very high view of what an elder should be and who an elder is and what an elder does. And I only have a high view of that because Scripture has a very high view of who an elder is and what an elder should be doing. 
Okay? Scripture has a high standard. In fact, I said, I've said this before. In Scripture, if you're looking at the local church and you're looking for job descriptions, there is no person held to a higher standard in the church, in the local body, than an elder. Okay? And so it's a tremendous responsibility, and, yet it's, and it's one that needs to be taken seriously. That's why in our church's bylaws, here at Lathrop First Christian Church, we have a set of bylaws that outlines the duties of the elders. And guess what? We have scripture beside every single one of those duties. When if, as long as there is a scriptural thing, there's only like two that's not going to be up on the screen. And that's just more of an administrative type thing. Okay? But look at this. These all have scriptures beside them. The elders should preside over the congregation as the leaders of the congregation. A lot of times people look at the minister or the pastor and say, Scott, you're the leader. Well, no, it's not supposed to be that way. The elders as a whole are to be the leaders of that congregation. Our bylaws also say this, number two, provide guidance and direction for the church board and the congregation as a whole to build up the body of Christ. That comes from Ephesians chapter 4 where it talks about the leaders of the church are supposed to be equipping the congregation. Number three in our bylaws, to watch over and to protect the congregation from spiritual dangers. That's what we see here in Acts chapter 20. We already read about it, about those uh, wolves coming in to tear the congregation apart. And who is to protect the congregation? The elders are. Number four, elders are to act as pastoral caregivers to the entire congregation. This is that idea, counseling. This is that idea, being there to lend an ear when somebody needs it. This is the idea of visiting the shut-ins and things like that. Number five, to set the example of holy living for all to see. If you're in this church and you're saying, I want to see somebody who is living Christ-like, you ought to be able to look at the, to the elders and say, there is an example of what it means to live a life holy and righteous, well-pleasing to God. That's what it looks like to live Christ-like in the world we live in today. Now, some people might say, Scott, well, you don't want to look to the elders, you want to look to Christ. Now, I agree with that. But the Apostle Paul even tells uh, one of his congregations, he says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. Let me be that physical, personal body that you see that you can emulate because I am emulating Christ. Okay? The, our elders should have that same attitude and live that same life. Again, it doesn't mean you're perfect. It doesn't mean that you won't mess up, okay? Number six, elders are to care for those sick and homebound. It's the elders that are to be going around to those sick, doing those hospital visits, going to the nursing homes, okay? Another thing about the counseling, which was back two steps, I know, is grief counseling. When somebody dies, it's the elders that need to be rallying around those families that have lost loved ones and saying, what can the church do to help you? Okay? And the last one we have in our bylaws that have that scriptural reference is be willing to continually learn as well as teach. Okay? And we saw that when it came to those qualifications about continually growing and about teaching others. And so these are the expectations of elders from Scripture. And our church has simply just taken it and outlined it in our bylaws to say it's our expectations of elders as well. If it's good enough for Scripture, it's definitely good enough for us. Okay? 
And so that is the expectation. Now, if we have elders that take their responsibilities and duties seriously, that minister on Sunday mornings, that pastor of the church, yes, he's called to do all those things as well, but his load is lightened tremendously. When if somebody's having struggles and stuff, they feel comfortable enough to go talk to an elder instead of the minister, that's great. You're not hurting my feelings. I'll, you can come listen. I'll come listen to you too. I'll come talk with you. That's great. But when you feel comfortable enough to do that with elders, that's what we're called to do. That's what those elders are there for. And you know, I really believe this. I would rather be in a congregation and we only have two or three elders that take their duties and responsibilities seriously than to be in a congregation with six, eight, or twelve elders that really just want a title and they don't want the responsibilities. Because I really do think our church structure that is the biblical church model for leadership was created to make sure all the duties and responsibilities that they didn't just fall on one person. And yet so often that's how we, as not just this congregation, as a whole, usually look at the person that stands up in the pulpit on Sunday morning. He is the one leader and he is the one person I'm supposed to call and have him do everything. But no, we have these elders that are there to be those spiritual leaders of the church as well. Let us pray. Lord God Almighty, we praise you and thank you for the blessings you've given us. And Lord God, in this congregation we have many people that have served as elders in the past and currently serving. And we just praise you and thank you for them and their service, Lord. And we just ask the next group of elders as they are coming up, Lord, that they evaluate your word and your will. They evaluate and take seriously those responsibilities of being an elder. If they say yes to being an elder, they understand fully what that entails. Lord God, be with us this coming week as we go through uh, our lives. And when we run into struggles, Lord, remember we have many people we can reach out to. It's not just about the minister or the pastor. It's about the elders as well. In Christ we pray. Amen.